to continue on, our next speaker is Kyle Clark. He is a graduate student with Dr. Jay Stopper at the Pennsylvania State University. Um, he drove up here this morning with his colleague Sarah, so bright and early. And Kyle is going to be discussing the distribution and abundances of French Creek mussels. everyone for having me. Uh, like she said, my name is Kyle Clark. I'm a master's student at Pennsylvania State University and I'm working with Dr. Jay Stauffer and Dr. Elizabeth Boyer at the Pennsylvania State University. And before I get started, I just want to thank Dr. Jay Stauffer and Dr. Elizabeth for facilitating my research and making this possible. And I'd also like to thank Nevin Weld from the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy for uh, consulting with us and helping us with muscle ID. Today, um, okay, so my outline's not there, but today I'm going to be talking to you um, about French Creek mussels, their distributions and abundances uh, at eight sites along the creek. Uh, first, I'm going to give you a little background on French Creek. I'm going to go over uh, how we selected our sites, how we uh, sampled for mussels, intersects with the Allegheny River. Uh, there's a pro approximately, give or take, 80 species of fish within the French Creek watershed. And there's also 29 species of freshwater mussels, four of which are federally endangered. Um, it's designated by the Nature Conservancy as one of America's last great places, and it's now facing uh, eminent invasion by the round goby. So, for those of you that don't know what a round goby is, it's a benthic dwelling fish. That means it lives on the bottom of lakes and rivers. Um, and this is just a vague description. Fused pelvic fins, it has frog-like eyes and a distinct black dorsal spot. That's really what gives it away. Um, oftentimes it's confused with our native species of fish, uh, codis or sculpin. And they can spawn several times a year. That's why they're so prolific in the lake and our streams. So the initial invasion, for those of you who don't know, uh, it started they're native to the Black and Caspian Sea and the Sea of Azov. Um, they were introduced to the St. Clair River via ballast water inadvertently. Um, and by 1994, uh, round gobies were throughout all five of the Great Lakes. Until, until recently, they were restricted to the uh, Lake Erie in Pennsylvania and its tributaries, but that has since changed. Um, in August of 2014, Fish and Boat was alerted by a, a local fisheries biologist that uh, they found round gobies in Lake LaBeouf, which is in just south of us in Waterford, Pennsylvania. Uh, fish and boat went in, did a uh, survey, and found that not only were the round gobies established, but they were breeding within the lake. Um, the following year, myself and several colleagues were sent by Dr. Stauffer to La uh, LaBeouf Creek to try and pinpoint where the invasion from was. Uh, in 2015, we found gobies not only at the head, walk, the head end, just below the lake, but we found them the entire length of the creek, but were unable to find any in the main stem of French Creek. Uh, in 2016, we went back in the spring, found gobies yet again all the way to the end of LaBeouf Creek, and actually found individuals inhabiting French Creek in the main stem. And since then, we've pinpointed the invasion front in French Creek. Um, in 2016 and 2017, we found evidence of them proliferating in LaBeouf Creek. Um, and just this year, we found evidence of unionic predation by um, round goby. This is actually a photo of some of contents. Um, is this uh, was taken by Casey Bradshaw at Allegheny College. She's working with us. And it was confirmed by Nevin Moe of the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy that they're most likely unionic species. Um, but we haven't run DNA analysis, so we don't know what individuals were consumed. So, as far as invasion front an invasion, they're in French Creek now. Um, why we're concerned, obviously we found evidence that they're predating on mussels, but in their native habitat, they eat zebra mussels. So it's kind of a natural thing. So, um, so because we thought that round gobies would eat native mussel species, we found it, we thought it would be important to monitor, set up ahead of time and monitor our native mussel species. 
So um, if you can look right here is Waterford, Pennsylvania, and just south of that is uh, Lavelle Creek, at where it intersects French Creek. So we had a basic idea where we wanted to set up sites uh, based on that. And we, we approached it in an informal method, looking for sites that we thought would be suitable, most suitable. Um, that slack water uh, behind islands and logs, shallow riffles before uh, real prominent riffles. And several factors came in, um, such as accessibility. But uh, really, when we floated uh, French Creek, we were looking for relic shells in the creek, uh, muskrat and raccoon bins, uh, just indicators that it would be a good area to sample. So what we decided on were three sites above the confluence of French Creek and LaBeouf Creek. Um, we decided on one site in LaBeouf Creek where the gobies were already inhabiting, and one site just below the confluence of French Creek and LaBeouf Creek where we had found gobies in the, in the main stem of French Creek. And then we selected three sites downstream as far as uh, Meadville in French Creek. When we chose a site to be our permanent sampling site, we went in with rebar stakes and set up a permanent 20 meter wide by 10 meter long uh, large quadrat. And we subdivided this using lines into two meter by two meter subquadrats. Uh, because searching for mussels is so time intensive, we couldn't sample the entire uh, 10 by 20 meter sub, uh, large quadrat. So we decided to sample five subquadrats in a diagonal fashion to capture the whole stream diversity um, across the stream. And we would work from the bottom right hand corner up into the top left hand, right, uh, top left corner. If the stream was wider than 40 meters, we decided to uh, place a second subquadrat, well, a second quadrat beside that. That only occurred at one site. Um, and before we started sampling, we took what we were interested in water chemistry to make sure that um, changes we saw during the sampling time were couldn't be attributed to water quality. So we took uh, water quality measurements above and below our muscle beds before we started. And um, during the sampling time, we also took uh, surface substrate measurements using uh, plexiglass board, and we took um, uh, standardized substrate sample to characterize uh, the substrate sizes. So once we set up the site, yet again, we sampled the five subquadrats. Um, all mussels were collected from each two by two subquadrat. Two snorkelers went in and spent as much time as they thought they needed to get all the mussels within that area. And generally, we just dug until we couldn't dig it anymore. They were transported in buckets back to the bank, and we took length measurements at the, the longest point. Uh, and each individual was, all, all the measurements were recorded for each individual, and it was identified down to species level. And then each individual was tagged with a silver metal tag and pink nail polish. Um, and each of those spots was covered with um, a special type of super glue. The salt, the drying agent in it is cyanoacrylate. And it requires moisture to, to uh, cure. So that's why we could use it underwater and get that back in the water so quickly. So um, the color tag and the color mark indicated which month we caught it. So that way, uh, upon multiple recaptures, we could tell if the individual had been caught one month or not. So some of our results for the study, we sampled three months, July, August, and we just finished up in September. We caught and released 3,418 individuals, some of which were caught multiple times. Of the 29 species that naturally occur in French Creek, we were able to collect 25 species. Um, the poorest survey site had zero individuals, and it had zero individuals the entire sample period. And the most abundant survey site had 728 individuals per survey. So that was at one point during the survey. And like I said, multiple recaptures per month, which was delightful to see. Um, also, um, when we were looking at our data, we're in the early stages of 
analyzing it. So I don't have any uh, figures, I don't have any statistical analysis, but we've observed that some muscles are only occurring at certain sites. So now we're gonna try to go back and characterize uh, the substrate and try to figure out if it's a function of how hard the ground was at that site um, or if it's a function of their host fish not being there. And we did, uh, for the study we compiled uh, a list of fish hosts present at each site while we were snorkeling as well. So, so future directions for our study. Um, this, the whole point of the project was to gather data before the invasion got that far downstream. So the whole purpose of the, the study is to act as baseline data for somebody else to come in and do population estimates the same. Um, we saw more movement than we expected. Um, I myself was not familiar with mussels coming into the project. I thought that they were a pretty sedentary uh, creature, but they actually move laterally and vertically within the substrate a lot more than we had anticipated. So that might be something that we um, study in the future. And then we also noticed that certain species were inhabiting different parts of the creek. So we might want to look into how specific species, um, what their preferences are as far as stream occurrence. Any questions? Do you have a place where you have uh, a substrate that hosts uh, multiple species? Yes. So um, the site with 728 individuals, that, that site had 12 or 13 species. And we had another site that also had uh, 18 species. So I have sites that have multiple species at them. I have some sites that had no mussels at them. And then I had intermediate sites. So it, was, it worked out kind of nice because I did have a gradient of uh, not only abundances, but uh, numbers of species. Is there any particular substrate where you can only find one species? Would that be like a real common one, something that's widespread? Or, or perhaps something that's not quite as common? Um, there were certain sites that only had, uh, for example, um, the snuff box, which is a federally endangered mussel. There were two or three sites that had snuff box, and then the other um, five or four did not. So we, that's the question we have to get at now, is to go back and look at the substrate sizes and try to decide was that a function, is that a function of the substrate that's there, or is that a function of their fish host stuff? And some of these mussels, um, like the common mussels, like your mucket, uh, they are able to use multiple fish hosts, and some of them are only allowed, well, only able to use a couple, so that might explain it further. Are there other mollusk eating uh, fishes in, in that part of French Creek that you could kind of tease out the effect of round gobies from those other potential predators? So. In French Creek, there's no native fish that eat, that consumes mussels that we know have, that we know of. Um, the only animals to predate on mussels that we know of are uh, otters, muskrats, and raccoons. So, but when you do see a case of predation via those those animals, it's pretty evident because you see you have middens on the side of the bank, and often they're tore open. So, but the goby. Um, is unique in the fact that it consumes the whole muscle and it's able to digest the whole muscle. You know, any of the uh, muscles use gobies as a host? I don't know exactly which species it is for sure, but I do recall um, Nevin, well, from the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, compiled a list of fish hosts for each of my, my muscle species. And I do recall seeing one of them um, is using a, the round goby as a fish host in Lake Erie. So there is one species that I know of that uses it as a fish host. They're, they're predating at such a rate that I don't think it would help. Right. Were you only in Lafayette or Creek area or did you get into French Creek area? So, so I had one site in LaBeouf Creek, and my seven other sites were in French Creek. And I spanned from where it split up at the south branch, 
a French Creek almost to um, up by Route 97, and I went clear down to Meadville. So I have sites distributed throughout the whole site. And there was three or four species and mussels that you didn't find? You said it was a 20? It was 25 of the 29. So the other four that you didn't find, are they there or are they just really They, they could be there. Find? They're really difficult to find. Uh, for example, the salamander mussel, it's fish, well, it's host is the, the hellbender. So they're not very, I mean, we have hellbenders in French Creek, but they're not widespread. So um, it might occur in deep pools. And that's another thing. Uh, a lot of my sites, I had, I was restricted by depth. Uh, because I'm snorkeling, I, I can't go down for five minutes and come back up. If I, if I was scuba certified, I could do that. Mm -hmm. but, um, I'm restricted by depth. So a salamander mussel, for example, would probably occur in deep pools with the hellbenders. Mm -hmm. And those same deep pools would have gobies as well? In, in theory, mm -hmm. in the future, yeah, that's what we're fearing, because gobies inhabit everything. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you mean white puppies? No. We we had help we had hellbenders. I have photos, and we caught mud puppies at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So we, we caught, and we have photos of hellbenders and mud puppies at one site, and at a second site, I have photos of a hell a hellbender. Okay, you were saying they were the Yeah, they are for a salamander mussel. Where did they attach the hellbender? I, I'm not sure if I had to assume just the outside, uh, like, I, I can't okay. give you a... Yeah, I was familiar with the one of the salamander Yeah. Okay. Are you looking at um, depth of and substrate that the mussels occur? Are you looking at different species that are deeper in the substrate versus... So, observational, while we were while we were sampling for mussels, we did see certain species like the spike uh, did occur fairly deep in the substrate. That's why we had to dig until we couldn't any further. Um, certain species like the spike were deep, but there were some species that laid right on top. Yeah, so um, some species would be able to have it. Yeah. So that was our, uh, our future directions. We kind of want to look at that. Um, but they have to come to the surface. And um, for, you, for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, most mussel species broadcast um, sperm and eggs like fish. Um, so they're susceptible to predation by the round goby. They do attach to, normally they attach to the gills of a fish and they, uh, they're parasitic for the first part of their life stage. They grow on the fish gill until they're big enough and then they drop off. And it's when they drop off, they're they're tiny so that the gobies are just cruising looking for them until they grow they can outgrow the size that they can eat. They're susceptible. Any other questions? Thank you. Stoneflies, 
cat's flies, but I'm also including, uh, for the purposes of this study, worms, clams, crayfish into my definition. So anything that lacks a backbone and can end up in my deep frame kick net is fair game as an aquatic macro invertebrate. And when you go to Google Scholar and you uh, look for macro invertebrates in Pennsylvania, within the first four pages, you get, there's 21 odd studies here, uh, but they really seem to fall into two patterns. The first is what is the effect that something has on aquatic macroinvertebrates? So what is the effect of acid mine drainage, the effects of macrophyte tannins, uh, the effect of seasonal distribution, mine drainage, or it's location specific. So macroinvertebrates of eastern Pennsylvania trout streams, in Pennsylvania springs, it's habitat specific, in the Susquehanna River, three Pennsylvania streams. We're not getting a picture of the diversity of macroinvertebrates across Pennsylvania as a whole. And it would be pretty difficult. I mean, when we talk about insect diversity, we're talking about tens of thousands of species. Um, whereas in Pennsylvania, we have about 400 fish species. So it's a little easier to quantify in the order of hundreds rather than thousands. There is one paper put out by the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy that looks at aquatic community classification. But again, these are very habitat-specific descriptions. Whereas if you go to Google Scholar and you say the fishes of Pennsylvania, there's four books that come right up to the top. One was published in 1893 by Bean, and even in the title it talks about the distribution of fishes across Pennsylvania. We have Ed Cooper's 1983 publication. Um, within his chapters, he discusses the distribution of fishes in Pennsylvania. Even the Fish and Boat Commission's relatively small publication at least alluded to the half of the state in which these uh, fishes occurred. And Stoffer's uh, 2016 publication, there's one fish book that you buy for the rest of your life, the pictures are beautiful, the maps are beautiful, the CT scans um, of catfish bones are beautiful, um, and I highly recommend it, but the maps and the descriptions of the distributions of what's native and invasive where is absolutely phenomenal. It is a, a great rendition of what our current knowledge is. But we don't have this for macroinvertebrates. Well, even in our dichotomous keys, you're using Merritt and Cummins aquatic invertebrates of North America, or you're using Barbara Pekarsky's macroinvertebrates of the Northeast. And if you're off of Google Scholar, if you actually still live in libraries uh, of your researcher, your PI, um, you may come across a book called The Zoogeography of North American Freshwater Fishes, um, another fascinating book if you can get off the internet. Uh, and there's a chapter in there that specifically talks about Pennsylvania drainages, and specifically the drainages we have, uh, the major drainages in Pennsylvania. I'm going to sum up about 41 pages for you in about 10 words. Uh, and looking at the biodiversity of fishes in Pennsylvania, when we look at our drainages, there's a clear pattern. The Ohio drainage in Pennsylvania uh, is the most diverse, followed by the Susquehanna drainage, followed by the Delaware drainage. That's when we look at the uh, major drainages of Pennsylvania, uh, but they can be classified at a larger level as well. We can look at the Mississippi drainage versus the Atlantic Slope drainages. And when we go most diverse to least diverse, the Mississippi drainage is more diverse than that of the Atlantic. So if there's no difference in aquatic communities among the drainages, then any fishes or macroinvertebrates collected um, should be the same. And I say here in the state parks, but she really wanted to know the diversity in Pennsylvania. Well, there's 80,000 miles of stream in Pennsylvania, and to sample all of them would be absolutely unrealistic, um, though I'd have a job for the rest of my academic life. So, so in 2016 and 2017, DCNR wanted a survey uh, of 10 state parks, and they wanted to know all of the aquatic fauna. We sampled lakes, we sampled streams, we did mussels, we did macroinvertebrates, fishes, and reptiles and amphibians while we were at it. Uh, for the purposes of this study, I'm purely looking at streams. Um, because these are state parks, and there's lakes, and they're meant for recreation, there's a lot of stocking that goes on, and so that's going to skew our natural distribution of fishes. And even within the history of Pennsylvania, fishes have been moved around uh, for recreation purposes. So within the study, we were very careful to designate whether a fish was native or non-native to a particular drainage. Um, so just a whirlwind tour of our state. Uh, if you haven't gotten around to the state parks, we sampled six parks in 
the Ohio drainage, they were on Cape Goddard, Cook Forest, Chapman, Bendigo, Clear Creek, and Laurel Hill, you will see some discrepancy, discrepancies in the number of collections for fish and macrovertebrates, and I blame that on the fact that the people collecting the samples were fish people, not macrovertebrate people. Um, so they didn't always make it back to the lab for me. We had three parks within the Susquehanna drainage. They were Pine Grove Furnace, Swatara, Nescopec, and one park over in uh, the Delaware drainage. So that's 56 fish sites that were collected once in 2016, once in 2017, for about 4,000 uh, fishes handled. And 51 macro vertebrate collections where I identified over 20,000 individuals. So what Kyle was lucky enough to be talking to you about is the master's thesis. We call this a side project. Uh, so briefly, our collecting methods, the fishes were collected with backpack electrofishing units in a 100 meter stretch, sampled over two years, and we were able to identify fish to species. Um, and I think we take that for granted sometimes. And I only say that because it's not the same for aquatic macroinvertebrates. Uh, for aquatic macroinvertebrates, we use a D-frame kick net. We do nine 20-second kicks, and Frost et al. in his 1971 paper said about that much sampling effort uh, provides you with 90% of the benthic community diversity. So we feel like we have a pretty good census um, of the aquatic macroinvertebrate community. These were only sampled once because I really didn't have any interest in identifying 40,000 individuals. Um, and we're only able to identify these to the lowest possible taxonomic unit. Bugs get beat up when you kick them into a net, so sometimes you can only identify them to the family level. And our dichotomous keys are only built to the genus level. So we already have a bias for a hidden level of diversity in our samples. For our statistical methods, we used a principal component analysis. I got very friendly with R this semester. Um, once you do a principal component analysis, you're able to take the principal components run an ANOVA, as well as two keys on a significant, significant difference. And as long as one of the axes provides you with a p-value of less than 0.05, you can start to infer differences among whatever you're comparing. We did decide to exclude the Clarion River. And I know I'm looking at patterns of diversity for the entire state, but it was the only fifth order stream that was included in our study. Uh, there will be other points that you'll see in my graphs that go, hey, those look like an outlier. But there's second and third order streams that we had plenty of to compare to. So order alone uh, was not enough to exclude the others. Uh, being the single fifth order stream, I was semi-okay with excluding it from this study. So a principal component looks a little bit like this. And this is actually for the fish data. So this is the fish principal component by parks. And we see there's a little bit of a divergence. Uh, well, a lot of a divergence. We have p-values far less than 0.05, saying that there is a difference among fish communities by park. But we wanted to lump those by drainage. So we lumped the Delaware drainage uh, park together, the Susquehanna parks together, and the Ohio drainage parks together. And we still see this vast difference. And then we lumped the Atlantic Slope parks with the Mississippi Slope parks. And why? Um, is this difference significant? It follows the pattern that Hokett laid out. Um, we're able to go in and look at which species load most heavily on these principal components, so what species are affecting uh, this divergence among the, uh, the Mississippi and Atlantic drainages, and they follow uh, the patterns laid out by Hokett. So if our fish data follows what's previously known about fish patterns of diversity, we should be able to make any reasonable conclusions about macrovertebrate fauna. Uh, so when we do that principal component analysis, we see that the parks are all over the place. Uh, but we have one axis where the p-value is less than 0.05. Um, so we have some differences between MK Goddard Cook Forest and Promised Land and MK Goddard State Parks. Um, so there's something unique going on um, in some of those tributaries, but it was only one string in each park. When we do a principal component analysis for macrovertebrates by small drainage, so lumping the Susquehanna and the Ohio parks together, uh, we see that there's a difference between the Susquehanna and the Delaware drainages, which is not consistent with the pattern we would be expecting. And when we lump the large drainages together, the Atlantic Slope drainages and the Mississippi drainages, uh, while there is this spread 
not enough. There is no difference in the composition of the Atlantic slope drainage macroinvertebrate fauna than there is from the Mississippi slope drainage fauna. So the patterns of macroinvertebrate diversity do not follow those of fishes in Pennsylvania. So why? Macroinvertebrates move. Uh, there's some different classifications of how macroinvertebrates can move. We have strong flyers, such as the caddisflies, who can fly over mountains and move among drainages. We have mayflies, who are weak flyers and might be able to fly to a nearby stream on the order of a kilometer or so uh, in order to spread its distribution. And then the non-flyers, so an adult water pony, right, is a beetle that crawls over the ground. If the environment between streams on the ground is not hospitable to this beetle moving, it's not going to be able to increase its range um, in any significant manner. So we do need to go back and look at uh, the distribution of the aquatic macroinvertebrate fauna within our parks and classify what are the strong flyers, the weak flyers, and the non-flyers. Taxonomic resolution. This is something I mentioned right off the bat. For macroinvertebrates, we're only looking at genus or higher level identification. So maybe there is a difference. We just can't detect it when looking at genus level data. And then spatial scale. What is the appropriate, appropriate spatial scale to look at aquatic macroinvertebrates? Maybe some of these are so uh, specific to certain habitats that it's not real, realistic to look uh, beyond that scale. Maybe we can only look uh, at a local scale, a water scale, shed scale or a landscape And there's uh, some conflict within the literature about what the appropriate scale to look at macroinvertebrates is. A lot of work is actually coming out of Finland on this, and they're pushing for a landscape, landscape scale. But because we don't have that species resolution, it's, it's really fumbling up some of the studies and current research going on. Uh, so we do need to dig a little bit more into uh, our data. This is a strong case, in our opinion, for why genetic and molecular techniques for species-level identifications for macroinvertebrates is so important to develop. Um, and it's just a world of wonder left still within aquatic macroinvertebrates. So with that, um, I'd like to thank the Stoffer Lab. It was a pretty small collection crew, uh, but I did get a little bit of help with uh, identification as well. We were happy to do this for DCNR. We thank them for their funding and for Fish and Boat Commission for working with us on the permitting. Um, and as always, the Pennsylvania State University is a great place to do research. So with that, I'll take any questions you have. Thank you. Yes? Have you looked at the fish data and just uh, taken them to genus level and see if uh, PCA terms of differences among those drainages? I mean, you have a, a testable prediction there. We have, and I, I've set, spent many hours slicing and dicing the data. You know, it doesn't matter if we say if it's a native or introduced species. Um, I have not grouped it to a larger level of identification. Um, I mean, we have the ability to go to species. I mean, that's, that's how we make management decisions. We don't make management decisions on the, the genus level, which is why I probably had no Right, I, I asked because you offered a hypothesis there that the difference, why you see that kind of spatial resolution in the fish is because you could take it a species, but we can't take the insects to the species. So it, it seems like you could test that prediction by, by doing that. But is that an accurate representation of our knowledge? Well, I wouldn't offer the prediction if, if you well, thank you and enjoy your lunch.